welcome back. So last time we started the very famous balcony scene and just looked a little bit of sort of a, oh, what I think is a cool idea about naming. Let's take a look a little more closely at this scene as it continues along with Romeo and Juliet's, not their first meeting, but their first intimate meeting where they're alone. And also they're alone under the cover of night. So quite a lot of privacy actually. What we see as the scene moves forward is what I think is pretty interesting is a difference between the written language versus the spoken language. And I'll just go ahead and let you know the words for those. We use the French words actually, langue, which is the written language, and parole, which is the spoken language. You can just add that to your vocabulary if you want. And it's a pretty interesting idea to think about that language is either written down or spoken. Now, let's think about that for a second before we look at how Romeo and Juliet considers the idea. When I write something down, it becomes static. It cannot change. History is written down and it's set much like our names are written down and it's hard to change our identity once it's given to us. But spoken language is not like that. Spoken language, when you speak it, it's gone away. It's not static, it's dynamic. And when we speak, it has a personal meaning of how I say the word or how I understand the word to mean versus written language like you learn in school, the word means this, you must write this way. But in speaking, you're so much more free. I think we can place this into the dichotomy of young and old. The written language is the old in the book, static, conservative, traditional, while the young would be the spoken language, which changes all the time with these modern ways of young people speaking, saying YOLO, things like that, um, IMO, BRB for the internet language. The spoken language is plastic. It can change. It's like a young person. It's full of potential. We see this in the text, actually. Romeo says to Juliet, by a name I know not how to tell thee who I am. By a name written down, I know not how to tell you who I am. My name, dear saint, is hateful to myself because it is an enemy to thee. Had I it written, I would tear the word, right? And Juliet says, my ears, this is not a written down language, this is a spoken language. My ears have not yet drunk a hundred words of that tongue's utterance, speaking, right? Yet I know the sound. This is spoken. And she says, art thou not Romeo and a Montague? And he says back to her, neither fair maid, if either thee dislike. That identity doesn't matter to me. I can find a new identity in you. Then uh, Juliet has a nice metaphor, I think. We have the garden wall that Romeo had to climb over to get in. Um, I want to see this as a metaphor because it's a blocking force. The garden wall that he climbs over is a metaphor and he overcomes it though. And he tells her, I flew over it on wings of love, right? So love is what's going to overcome this blocking force um, for them. If we skip ahead a little bit, we'll see this long passage from Juliet, also very empowering for her character to give a female character so many lines to speak. This is the section that begins on line 85. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face, else would a maiden blush. So she's telling him, I'm very modest. You're here, you saw me in the middle of the night, and I should tell you to go away, but I don't. And she doesn't want him to think that she's very forward, that she's not proper. So she's very concerned about her appearance as well. And she says, tonight, fain would I dwell on form, but she can't dwell on form. That's why it's fain, she cannot, because she cannot see him. So it makes you think a little bit here that maybe Juliet's not totally in love with his looks because here she cannot hear him. However, Romeo has sweet words and that seems to be what convinces her. But again, the spoken words, and so she says to him, I know thou wilt say, I, and I will take thy word, that spoken word. Yet if thou swearest, thou mayst prove false. This is the idea there too. When you say I, I can believe you. But if you swear, to swear something is to set it down static. Julia doesn't want that. She wants him to speak the words with that power, that youthful power of voice. They say, Jove laughs. O gentle Romeo, if thou dost love, pronounce it faithfully. And say thee nay, so wilt thou woo, say, say, say. We keep seeing that rep rep repetition over and over again. But then there's a move for Juliet. 
the words of love are great, but words are not the same things as actions. And that's what she wants to push Romeo toward, and we see it clearly in line 100, where she says, but trust me, gentlemen, I'll prove more true than those that have more cunning to be strange. This idea of proving to be true is the idea of not just saying I love you, but of doing that. And then later, Juliet's going to tell Romeo, if you do love me, you have to do something. You have to marry me. So here we have a movement from a disregard for written language to the power of spoken language and to how that language spoken should become action, which kind of reminds you of youthful people. They're full of action, activity, passion to get things done. Okay. What I wonder about when I read this um, text is why is the moon a negative symbol in here? Generally in literature, the moon is very positive. The moon has great power. It controls the tides. It's a symbol of women, a symbol of fertility. It's a symbol of the seasons changing, of growth. It's a good thing. But in this book, it's not. Well, it's made clear on line 109 why it's not. Romeo says to Juliet, I want to swear to you that I love you, and I will swear by, and she stops him. And she says, don't swear by the moon. And in line 109, she tells us why. Oh, swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon. Inconstant means unfaithful. That monthly changes in her circled orb, lest that thy love prove likewise variable. You know the moon. Sometimes it's full and so beautiful in the sky, and sometimes it's just a small little sliver. That's not the kind of love that she wants. I think instead she would want a love like the sun. The sun rises and we know when it rises. We can say the minute and the hour of the sun's rise and it can depend on the sun rising. We know that the sun will rise tomorrow because it always has risen. And it's the sun that gives us life. It's the sun we can depend upon. Swear by the sun if you will swear at all. And in this way the sun, which is generally a negative symbol in literature, it's hot, it's oppressive, but here it's a positive one. He's Shakespeare's playing with this. He's switching them around, right? Okay. The other thing I like for light is that Juliet um, uses another symbol of light and it's very powerful um, image of lightning. Now we already understand the moon, how it's used in this text, the sun, how it's being used in the text. Now lightning, think about that. Do I want your love to be like lightning? Sure, lightning's cool. It looks great. It shoots across the sky. It's unexpected. It's spontaneous. Oh, I want love like that. No, that love is short-lived. It happens, and then it's gone and forgotten. That's not the kind of love that Juliet wants either. Okay, so I had asked at the beginning to look for these images of light. Hopefully you notice these, and I'm trying to help you think about what they might mean. Let's go even further, because I'm not done talking about light. We haven't talked about Juliet's name. Juliet, the name comes from July. And July is the month of summer, when the sun is highest in the sky. We see this um, when we go to a line about 121. Uh, G Romeo says to Juliet, I'm sorry, this is Juliet's line. She says, good night. This bud of love, this flower of love, by summer's ripening breath, the sun makes our love grow. And Juliet is the sun. She is July. And what I also like about this now is that Romeo has come to her at night, but not an artificial night from, the, from Act One, but a real night. But this artificial night has been gotten rid of because within this very real night, there is still the sun, the light of Juliet. If we think about it, it's such a beautiful symbolic idea of what love is and what, why this play is such a famous tale of love. Okay, I think we have um, time for one last idea. And what I want to explain this time is a literary device called a metonym. A metonym is related to a metaphor. Let me first define what a metonym is. A metonym is kind of complicated, but it's when the part represents the whole. So, I might, instead of saying the king of England, I'll say the crown of England. The crown that the king wears, the part, represents the whole, right? Metonyms, though, we can link them together. So I can say, the sun represents their love, 
the stars represent their love, or lightning represents their love, or the moon, all these different things that are all light, that can link them together as parts that create the whole metaphor of types of love. The moon is a metonym for the inconstant love. The sun is the metonym for constant and dependable love, lightning for quick love, right? And we tie them all together to form a metaphor of love. Okay, think about that a little bit. I know it's complicated, but if you can understand how metonyms work, you can link them all together to create a controlling metaphor for a text, and it's great for interpretation and will really impress your teachers. Okay, let's pause there and we'll pick it up next time.